Welcome to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine nutrition research digested for you. I'm your host, Clayton Chastain, and today we have with us Darren Shipman, a PhD candidate at South Dakota State University. So Garen, you've been on the show before, but before we get started, would you mind giving the audience a brief reminder about your background? Yes, I'd love to. Uh, thank you for having me again on this podcast. Um, I'm Garen Shipman. I'm originally from the Charlotte, North Carolina area. Uh, grew up around our culture, semi-permanent, uh, semi, but half and half, but so I did my undergrad and bachelor, my undergrad my bachelor's and master's at NC State, where I got introduced to pigs through Dr. Billy Flowers and just fell in love with the swan industry and particularly sows. So during my master's, I focused on attempt sow work and then followed up with a PhD here at South Dakota State under Dr. Levesque. A majority of my PhD has been focused on the corporation and utilization of various fibers technologies for gas stain sows. Uh, one that I talked about before was the carbohydrates enzymes and uh, for nutrient utilization, digestibility for sows, and then also as a, a prebiotic product. And now this current study we looked at was evaluating a post protein DTGS product for utilization in usage and gas stain sow diets. Gotcha. So I read those abstracts you sent me about the post-protein separation distillers and comparing that to other fiber sources. So on those two studies you guys ran there, what all did you see when comparing the that post-protein separation DDGs to those other fiber sources? Yeah, so first of all, I think it's important to talk about the this high fiber post-protein separated uh, DGS product. So the as we are increasing uh, the production of biofuels such as ethanol and biodiesel, most of the feedstocks that we would utilize in our swine diets are being also used for the production of these ethanols and biodiesels. However, the leftover products, leftover co-products, just at the DDGS, have been utilized and studied in swine diets. Uh, we look at gas stain sows, and not been that many studies with gas stain in gas stain sow diets. However, the studies that, ha that have been conducted, there were inconsistencies between studies, just as in terms of litter sizes after once the sow farrowed. So once, so thing to step back, we know, looking over it, we know that the gas stain sow has a higher energy and disability in nutrient utilization compared to that of grow pigs. So there was a potential that most of the DDGS and other corn fermented co-products were probably most likely being underformulated or overformulated into the gas stain sow diets, most likely due to the fact that most of our energy values published such as the NRC or even with the prediction equations through NRA that you were not being dyes were not being formulated correctly. And so from terms of sustainability, when we have an inaccurate diet formulations, we increase the potentially increase improper nutrient neutralization and as well as increased diet cost. So the we did this study with Poet who fed this post protein, who had this post protein high fiber fraction DDGS. Um, they evaluated four and grow pigs and wanted to see how, how what it would look like when fed the gas stained sows. So we started with these a disability study looking at energy and nutrient disability for gas stained sows, and we compared that to the two most likely common candidates for fiber sources in sow diets, that being soy holes and the post and sugar beet pulp. So from there, we looked at what we did find was that the DDGS did have a higher, did have a higher uh, digestible energy and metabolism energy content compared compared to that of the soybean soybean holes and the sugar beet pulp. But another thing that we also found was when we did an in vitro fermentation, looking at gas emissions, potential 
when we looked at when we conducted a vitro fermentation using uh, the same fiber sources and well as well as the the same fiber source. What added that one part up? So when we did an in vitro fermentation uh, study looking at these fiber sources as well, we did find that the gas emission from the sugar beet pulp was higher than that of the soy holes in the post MSC DDGS. So from the standpoint of sustainability, one of them is to limit gas emissions on the by livestock. So even though gas emission is negligible in guru pigs, that's not the case for gas stained cells. So when they're fed these, being fed these fibrous ingredients. So from there, how does this gas emissions look between the different fiber sources? And we did find that the gas emissions using a in vitro fermentation procedure were higher when sows were fed the post were fed the sugar beet pulp compared to the other two fiber sources. But another thing to point out was when we did a VFA analysis on the on the uh, fermentation residue, we saw that the volatile fatty acids that would be fermented and produced by microbes in the hindgut did were had an equal amounts between all fiber sources, especially for our more energy efficient or energy efficient volatile fatty acids as acetate, propionate, and butyrate. Gotcha. So one question I had when comparing this post protein separation distillers grains against conventional distillers grains, what would you say would be some of the main nutritional differences between the two? So, so the many of the various companies such as Poet, the Andersons, and a few others, they have kind of refined their DDGS to maximize the maximize the uh, nutrient profile. So one of them, one of these aspects has been separating the and extracting the high protein content from the DDGS to sell as a high protein DDGS, as well as a, or as a corn fermented protein. With that being said, we have these leftover fiber fractions in DDGS that are not going to be used. And so would these potential have to be included in gas station style diets due to their high fiber fraction. But they also at the same time have a similar crude protein and ether abstract. Well, not ether abstract. The same at the same time they have a, a similar crude protein and fat content as that compared to the uh, conventional DDGS. Awesome. And one more question I had for you. So in terms of looking at VFA production, you had an increased butyrate production um, when feeding this post-protein separation DDGs. Um, but what, what does that translate into in terms of actual benefits on the animal? What, what, what do we mainly see with a higher level of butyrate uh, production? Yeah, so those are primarily going to come from the breakdown of the other of the amino acids, fermentation of the amino acids in the hindgut. Um, but what we primarily want to focus on is the is focus on the volatile fatty acids of so acetate, the acetate, butyrate, and propionate as your energy efficient um, products of microbial fermentation in the hindgut. A leader in swine nutrition solutions driven by science. Novus's products and services look at the whole animal, focusing on productivity and well being in order to feed the world affordable and wholesome food. For more information, visit Novus's website at www.novusint.com. Gotcha. Well, I believe that's all we have time for. So thank you, Garen, for coming on the show and sharing all your research with us. Thank you. Yep. And everyone else, thank you for listening to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt podcast. Please visit us at swinenutritionblackbelt.com. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast channel so you won't miss out on the next episode. See you next week. Hey everyone, we're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. 
If you have a swine nutrition related research trial and would like to come on the show and share it with us, feel free to email the details about your research to hello at wisenetics.com. Oh.